Thanks for tuning in to The Real Deal Show, brought to you by ebodyboarding.com and Tribe Boards. Hey folks, Jay Real back at you with The Real Deal Show, and we are with legendary body surfer and inventor, I'll call you an inventor, Fred Simpson, the man behind Viper Surfing Fins, and we uh, had part one uh, last week, hope you enjoyed that. We're going to pick it back up and hear the rest of the Fred Simpson story. Thanks for being back with us again, Fred. <laughs> Boy, <laughs> Appreciate it. Why, it's a pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. You're so sincere. So we were talking last week about the design of the Viper Fin and how it changed uh, since its invention. We talked about the elimination of the vertical edges on the bottom, the addition of a drain hole, and the splash of color, which interestingly enough you shared with me that uh, body surfer John Shearer kind of inspired adding color so the judges in body surfing events could see the fin mm -hmm. um, so as the, have there been any other modifications to vipers I know the answer and you know the answer is yes because initially there was a, a seven inch blade on the viper and oh, then yeah. eventually you released a V a five inch blade called the V5, and now there is a V5 and a V7. What inspired those changes? Uh, it was the uh, the thing that uh, was uh, the I copied the, the the duck foot. Yep. And uh, it came out as a it was a twelve inch blade, a long blade. Yeah. And. For bodyboarding, it was too long. Okay. So by now, bodyboarding was taking off. Oh, yeah. And you knew bodyboarders wanted to use your fins. Well, yeah. This, that happened, too. Yeah. But, uh, <clears throat> but the, uh, I mean, it wasn't a, it wasn't a replacement. It was, you can do it if you want, but it's, uh, the bodyboarders have, don't, don't need a big fin. Yeah, because they have the board to float them. Well, they don't need and, as much power. Yeah, and, uh. And then, uh, uh, and and the lifeguards, uh, if you're making rescues with a with a 12 inch blade, you got to make sure the guy behind you that you're pulling on the on the buoy can't reach and pull on your fin. All right. There was that stick. I didn't think about that. Yeah, it's what the, so that would happen periodically. But you still wanted a seven inch blade for the body surfing crowd. Yeah. And the five inch blade, you kind of catered towards the body borders. Yes. And eventually you released a flex model because you, you, I guess the market told you, we want something that's not quite as stiff, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And, it, and, it, and it's still to this day, it goes like that. Yeah. Um, I mean, they, they, people do everything differently in the water, you know? Sure. And, and kicking your legs and fins yep. in the water uh, is. It's, uh, the size of the fin makes a big difference. Yeah. Just the feel. Yep. And um, also the performance. Yeah, I know, you know, we sell more V5s than V7s, obviously, because our market here at eBodyboarding is mainly bodyboarders, but a lot of bigger guys, yeah. heavier guys, prefer the V7s. Boom, you hit the nail on the head. Yeah, so um, now you made kind of a dramatic change somewhere around 2013, as I recall. You decided to to mix things up and you introduced the Viper Vector uh. and originally Vipers, at, at some point you added, the, let's go back before the Vector though, you added the neoprene padding inside the fin. <clears throat> so can you talk yeah. about that? Okay, yeah, well the neoprene padding came about because before that, this particular point in time, all the fins were rubbing the top of the feet right. pretty badly. And that's because the rubber is, is such that it, w it has a tendency to skin to, to tidy the skin. So we 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 now provide pa uh, packages, or you can buy the the neoprene pads. Neoprene separately. pad kit, yeah, yeah, and it's just neoprene, like wet wetsuit material, with a pad with a uh, f uh, f design on it uh, on the pad, and you cut that thing off the pad. And the rubber side, you rim the thing with a, a like super glue. Super glue, yeah. yeah. And slide it in there and, and attach it to the top of the foot pocket. 
and that's we had to go in the, at the store at the factory doing that all day long. Yeah, so th but they came with the neoprene pads in them. Yeah. For many years. Yes. And then in 2013, you said, "Let's just switch it up. We're going to go with the Viper Vector." Okay. So what prompted that? You wanted to get a floating fin because initially these did not float, right? Yeah, they float. Oh, okay. Yeah. So they you switched to, to the surface. Yeah. But they float. Okay. Uh, and like, if actually, at the wedge, when it would come off at the peak, if you're right in the peak, <laughs> you're never going to find it. Well, you got to run up the up the yeah the, the, the way the wedge is. The, it's it breaks it. it it's a reflection. Yes. It's a reflection of a parallel wave. Yeah. Here's the here's the jetty and here comes the end current. That's the south. That's Mexico down there. Yeah. Actually, in Mexico over there. But as the as the south swell comes up, it rides up here. This is a 14 foot high wall. It climbs the wall and then re reflects off off. And as it go, going up here, it's putting an angle fin, angle wave, to to run on on the next wave that's coming. Yep. So it so pushes it hitting, way down yeah, the beach. It's not hitting, and it's it's reflecting off as it comes down, and that thing is going to, yeah, it takes it from the jetty at Newport Beach all the way up to the bridge, at the almost all, all the way up to the... Uh, uh, the, uh, the pier, uh, like Balboa yeah, Pier. Yeah, so yeah. It, it pushes it all the way up the up, up the beach. So, so if you, your fin came off, you basically had to walk along the beach, yeah, hoping it, that thing was going to wash in and yeah, keep walking until yeah, you yeah. get to Balboa yeah, Pier. <laughs> yeah. So that's that thing. Then. Yeah. So yeah. the vectors. The what, vectors. Yeah. What prompted that? That okay. change. To make the fins today and make them back then, that prompted the. Uh, manufacturing in a in the uh, injection molding, you had to put a valve on somewhere on here where you could attach a a, a, a full hose that would take the mix of rubber instead of it being strips and hard. It's liquid. It's liquid. Oh jeez! And it squeezes through and gets in there and then hardens up so that it's the correct durometer. Yep. How 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 hard it feels when you pinch it, or how loose, how flimsy it is when you pinch it, and it uh, the 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 hard rubber, the hard rubber that's been blended and everything else, and then compressed and and built in that that form is versus this form, two hours, twenty minutes. Oh, uh, big difference. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, manufacture you could crank out a lot more fins Tons. with the Vector Tons. rubber. Yeah. Um, so the Vector fins <coughs> came in a yellow or an orange. Yeah, solid color. Yeah, and totally different. Because there's no blending it. Right, and there's no neoprene no. Um, glued inside. So how did the public receive this dramatic change in the classic Viper fin? Uh, like it... Uh there's those like John Shear yep. mentioned before, likes him a lot better. And he's, 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 I mean, he's sold on 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 vector filled, filled uh, injection yeah. molded, and and a lot of people are the ones who have them really yeah. love them. Yeah. So I mean, what they're I lighter found, and they're lighter. They were lighter. Yeah. So that's what we found is when we started selling them. Initially, they sold great because. It's something new and different, yeah, yeah. but it's still a Viper fin. So a lot of people bought them, and then the old school people started coming back out of the woodwork asking for the old version of Vipers. So yeah. around 2016, as I recall, you guys decided to go back to the old Vipers minus the neoprene pads. I guess the neoprene pads were a bit of a pain, right? Because the glue would come undone and yeah, people would want a warranty them, yeah, right? It's That's like, a hassle. It's like just take right? your own take your own wetsuit and glue it on something, and then you put it on your feet, and then start kicking something like this. Right, right. So um, when you and it wears it out. Yeah, I, totally. I mean, I you know we saw them, some people would bring them back in and say, "Oh, the neoprene came unglued. Yeah. I want a new pair." And I just say, just get a tube of super glue. Yeah. <laughs> you fix it in five minutes. Actually, um, actually, the, yeah. the glue that worked the best, but you had to buy it twelve in a box, 
is is a glue called Zappagap. Zappagap. Do they still make that? I think so. Really? Yeah. So you heard it from Fred Simpson. If you're if you're getting the aftermarket neoprene pads and it comes unstuck, Zappagap. I've never heard of that. Now I want to show the new version of Viper fins, which of course we sell, and you can we can compare it to the old one. So this is the new version of the Viper fin. Very clean, has the yellow splash, the drain hole, the vertical edges on the bottom are gone. The vertical edges on the top, now this is a V5 versus this original Viper, which is a V7. So if you can look at these on the camera, there's a big difference in the size. Um, but many things stay the same. You still have the Pacific Southswell logo. The basic shape of the fin is the same and you have the yellow splash. Um, vertical edges are tapered on this V5 a little bit more than the old um, original fin, um, but still the same basic design. And this one is a, a really good seller for us. We still do really well with Viper fins. And they're back to the original rubber, original design, um, minus the neoprene pads, um, but they still do the same job. So let me ask you this, like bodyboarding, did bodyboarding change your business a lot at the sport of bodyboarding because you started kind of catering to bodyboarders with this V5 oh, yeah. design? Yeah. yeah, for sure. Now you, being a hardcore body surfer at the Wedge, sometime in the, let's say, early 80s when bodyboarding started taking off and bodyboarders started showing up at the Wedge, how did the body surfing crew take that I mean because it, it really disrupted the pecking order I think at the wedge right and it initiated the whole black ball situation that's in place to th to this day right uh yeah that that was a political thing I think somewhat in there that where where they they outlawed they eliminated non bodyboarders yes you had to be a bodyboarder to be out there. Really? Yeah. You mean, so now the way it works, right, is, is you can't have any sort of flotation device be, between the hours of 10 and 5, and that's from May 1st to October 31st. Now, I don't know what the rules are today. Do you know? That the, is, the, that's the current rule as no I know No flotation yeah. device? Yes. No flotation devices between 10 and 5. So bodyboarders, they come before 10 and yeah. after 5, and the body surfers have free reign during those hours yeah. and they fought hard the Wedge Preservation Society yeah. which is a group of longtime body surfers yeah. fought hard to maintain that that those hours for the body surfing because yeah. quite honestly it's it, I totally get it I get it from the body surfing perspective all these board riders come in and it's almost impossible for a body surfer to get a wave amongst that crowd, many of whom don't know the history of body surfing at the Wedge, goes back to the beginning of yeah. when the jetty was built, Yeah. right? So I think for the most part, it's a, it's a symbiotic relationship now with the body surfers and the board riders. Everybody gets their time, so to speak. Have you heard otherwise from your longtime wedge cohorts? Well, no, I've been out of the water <clears throat> for quite a while now. But, okay. Uh, for health reasons and stuff. Yeah. And uh, I, uh, I have not been. A, see, I've not been talked to anybody. That's there are any fights going on that I've that I heard of. Okay. I don't think. Yeah. I haven't heard of anything anyway. Yeah. Because if you, if you're if you're a rude body surfer, you're really a rude person. <laughs> sure. No, I get it. But I mean, back in the day, you must have seen some clashes, like in the Ron Romanowski days, Bill Sharp, uh, Terry Wade, and you know all those yeah, Ter legends. Terry, Terry Wade was not an aggro. Romo's pretty rough. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but, but he's got, he's, you know, he, to give a background, he got sent over to Vietnam. It was peace. Of course. And Fred had gone down and joined the National Guard. Yeah. And then I had, I had three months of basic training. Yeah. And, and then I never had to shoot anybody. Yeah. Never, no human in, the, in my sights. 
in the Romo. I'm over at his house. I, he's showing me different shots of stuff over the, out there, and, and there's this this uh, picture of foliage and stuff that's a jungle, and and then it's just this bright red bush, really fancy blood. looking, covered in blood. No, just yeah. the bush was red. I said, I said, what 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 kind of plant is that? He says, that's where my, where my buddy was standing when the when the Round to hit. Oh, jeez. Cannon round. Wow. You know, I'm <laughs> just going, uh oh. So, yeah, he had been through some traumatic stuff over yeah. in Vietnam. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, Romo, when I started riding the wedge in the late 80s, he was a guy to be respected and feared at the same time. Yeah. You know, you didn't want to cross paths with him. He was a kneeboarder out there, but he also, yeah, you know, good saw, kneeboard. yeah, really That's good right. and started, um, taking pictures, you know, and yeah. actually sort of embraced the bodyboarders, but recognized the ones that had respect for yeah. the history of that spot and the yeah. people that wrote it. There was a lot of younger kids that came along and they didn't respect the wedge and they, you know, they would just take off on any wave and they didn't have any feel for, oh, this guy's been here for years, years and years. So Romo, I think he recognized, you know, yeah. certain guys are okay because they respect that. Yeah. They don't take every wave. They give and take a little bit of both. And, uh, you know, he, I think he kind of got along okay with some of the riders. Another guy, Mel Thoman. Mel Thoman, yeah. Um, Mel, longtime body surfer at the wedge who also has been a friend of some of the bodyboarders i remember mel used to have a telephone surf report yeah for the wedge because he would check it every day yeah go do, and, and he would do different characters he lived up on the bluff and he would go down and see what's going and come yes. back and telephone and he'd say how yeah. big it was what yeah. the wind was doing yeah and there were no cameras back then no. Surfline had a report but you they didn't do a wedge report, oh. and you always knew if they said Huntington Beach was three to four, wedge was probably twice that size on the face. And I remember it was like the holy grail, like hitting the lotteries. My friend Robbie Crawford, another yeah. wedge, longtime wedge bodyboarder and photographer, gave me Mel's phone number. And Did he, he said, don't tell anyone where you got this number. <laughs> You could call this number oh, and you could get man. a report, man. Yeah, that's so pretty, pretty, pretty funny. I would call and I would just pray that Mel didn't actually pick up the phone. Yeah. Because I didn't want to <laughs> say, this is, I'm a pro bodyboarder named Jay Real, and he, <laughs> he would have banned me from for life from yeah. the spot. So I would get the reports, and if it was decent, <laughs> I'd show up in the afternoons. But, yeah, I mean, you were, you were kind of moving out of that whole um, wedge hierarchy in one way. In that you know your cumulative injuries are were taking their toll, and uh, you mentioned a minute ago health reasons. You sort of slid out of yeah. being a regular at the wedge. Can you talk about some of the health situation that you've had in you know recent years since you stopped body surfing out there? Well, um, the the ones that keep me out of the wedge uh, that. You know, I didn't want to go down there and do anything. It was a, my sinuses and stuff. I had all my. I was the only guy on the earth that was wearing nose clip the oh. entire time. My mom made me wear nose clips, and I, I actually couldn't keep water out of my nose, and I had sinus condition. <clears throat> and uh, kind of get into my lungs and stuff. But uh, the uh, this is what. Yeah, so we're talking initially skin cancer, yeah, right? Yeah, skin cancer, yeah. So back in the day, uh, sunscreen wasn't really a thing, right? No, I no, I can I can remember uh, I can remember one time while well, I was guarding, but the, the the captain said, "Hey, what do you guys put on your skin so it doesn't cook you?" And it was, you know, uh, see the ski or something. Oh, my God. Like, yeah, like uh, suntan yeah, oil. Yeah, yeah, Copper tone oil. Yeah, but uh, I, I, uh, no, I never let that bother me that much. Yeah. You know. So, well, I mean, you know, do you, this is your public service announcement chance. Oh, yeah. Like, you know, skin cancer is real. A lot of friends of mine, yeah. and, and you're included, have 
dealt with the cumulative effects of sun exposure. If you had it to do all over again, would you have done anything different knowing what you know now? Obviously, sunscreen yeah, would have I, been applied liberally, I, I right? Didn't, I, didn't use, I didn't have sunscreen until I was uh, out of high school. Yeah, because it really didn't exist. Didn't I mean, it, yeah. when I was a kid, it was cool to peel skin off your nose. I know, yeah. It, you were a surfer if yeah. you had, did that. So we would actively try to sunburn our noses. Oh, yeah, well, it was be crazy. get tan, you know? Yeah, yeah, that's it. It was get get a tan were the, the advertisements. They actually sold co cocoa butter oil yeah. or cocoa, whatever, coconut oil. You'd put oil on your skin. Yeah. To enhance your tan. Magnify you the sun. Yeah, you never see that anymore. You'll never no, see an advertisement no, no. for get tan. Now it's like block the sun out. No, I don't think, I wonder if they even allow it. <laughs> I doubt it. It's God. probably, yeah, it's like smoke and ca cigarette commercials that yeah. existed when I was a kid, gone from the airwaves. But so you, you know, you've basically soldiered on despite all the issues with the skin cancer. Yeah. Well, and you're just, you just keep powering through, man. What's the secret? I mean, you just want to put one foot in front of the other every day and well, keep going, you know, man. It's a uh, it's more fun to be alive and doing stuff than, yep. than being alive and worrying about not being able to do fun stuff. Yes. You know. Well, let me ask you but, this: Your Anne, your wife. Yes. How many years you guys been married? As last Thanksgiving, sixty. Sixty years of marriage. Any kids? Two daughters. Two daughters. So that alone is reason <laughs> to get out of bed every day, right? Yeah. That's amazing. Get me out of bed. Yeah, <laughs> they they make you get out of bed every day. Uh, so now, here it is, 2022. How involved are you in the running operation of Viper Fins? Well, I'm slowly. These days? I'm slowly. I I can't um, can't spend much time doing it, but uh, I'm. It's come. Kind of, I'm in the process of handing it over to JP. Okay, and we're talking about JP Patterson, one of the first ever pro bodyboarders, who we will get on a future episode, and JP is going to do the. The management, the running of, of the company. He's been involved in Viper Fins yeah, since yeah. the beginning. Yeah, well, yeah, well, right? you know, he 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 called me. He got a hold of me. He was raised in Hawaii, you know. That, yes. Yeah. And he was one of the first guys in Hawaii to hey, I want to have some Viper Fins and all that stuff. He and Kainoa and then uh, a couple of other guys are mixed kind of, yeah. like, you know. Yeah. But JP lived it through hit a holiday Friday. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to talk to JP about that. <coughs> That's and, right. Kill yeah. Howley Day. <laughs> and uh, yeah, but he's a uh, he's a gutsy guy. Yeah, and he's he's got a big family. Goes off. Yeah, and he's got a really profitable business that he he runs his own. Yeah. So I mean, he's perfect because yeah. I. I mean, he's been our Viper rep since we started this business in 1999. Yeah. So his name is synonymous with the brand. Any picture you ever look at, uh, at of JP online, you're going to see him in Viper. So JP's going to take it over. What's what's your day to day nowadays? Do you have a pretty relaxed schedule? Do you yeah, uh, actually have any hobbies? No, yeah, watching TV. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what are you watching? What's no, the, you... I go to. I, I try to get out of the wedge if it's really, really, really good. Yeah. And that doesn't mean big. That that that. Not necessarily no, big, just good shape. Size made all the difference before. Yeah. But now, if if I can get down there and and it's breaking good. Yeah. I'll go in. Okay. Really? Yeah. Even now. I will. I'm gonna. I'm gonna make it when I turn a hundred. <laughs> oh my god, yeah. I love that! Somebody I has to be there to record that. Uh, um, here's a question: I know everyone's gonna want to know the answer to. Biggest swell you've ever seen at the wedge? Top to bottom. Top to bottom, face height. Let's. And I'm yeah, going back to when they had poles on the jetty. Yeah, or yeah. Or is it after that, like Hurricane Marie? <coughs> I well, you know, it's seven a, years the ago. Jetty's fourteen feet high, and then on top of that, we're telling pole 
telephone poles running out to the lighthouse that used to be at the end of the jetty. And they removed those yeah. more like 2010 maybe, right? The poles on the jetty, maybe earlier. I don't remember. Uh, maybe, uh, yeah, they, before 2010. Okay, so, and, yeah. And uh, if, you, if you got it right, you coasted over the top, if you could stay there with the, without sliding down, I mean, it, the river, you know, the, 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 when you get in some big stuff like that, and you, you get uh, things you can gauge it from, the, the, the big, the little wave, the big wave goes up, 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 and it keeps coming in, keeps coming in, and if you can, you can sit up here and it'll start you down there without you even trying. Yeah. It start letting you coast. Gravity. Down to the front. Yeah. Now you're in the wave, and and if it gets to a certain point, that the wave instead of being flat becomes convex, and you you you're either in it, you're either dropping out of it, and you know, so you you're not yourself anymore. So what's the biggest swell? We we'll, we'll get back I'm to the go, initial I'm question. I'm gonna go. Um, Face on the, and I went with after a big thing when so, so a bunch of Hawaiians were over and I, I I interviewed those guys too. I was out with them. I said, "What was the biggest thing you saw out there? Not that you took, but the biggest one that you might have not gone on." Yeah. He said, "I think about thirty-six feet." And when was that? Oh, back five years ago, ten years ago. Oh, so in recent years yeah. is the biggest you've seen it or heard of oh, it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So none of the swells from the 60s or 70s or 80s, none of that topped what we had six or seven years ago. Now, seven years ago was Hurricane Marie in oh. August. That was, for me, the biggest swell I've ever seen in How Southern big, California. How big would you call it? Well, I mean, I saw I didn't surf the wedge on that swell. I surfed some spots in this area, but I saw pictures of the wedge, solid thirty foot face, yeah. maybe bigger. You know that yeah. one where the where the the peak the peaks here, and you see a, a, a surfboard up on top. Yes, of it? that's a bodyboard. That's a, I think yeah. I think it might have been a Romanowski bodyboard. Wow. <laughs> yeah, and then and, and then. Uh, uh, first time I went to Hawaii, early, very early on when I went to Hawaii, I, I was invited to go to a, a, a seminar they were having at an auditorium over there. And I don't know who the guy was talking that was in charge, but I don't know if it, But they were having a problem in Hawaii with the fact that the boys would come in off the beach, uh, uh, you know, out, out of the water, and... Uh, in a Hawaiian style, they say, you know, it would be a 20 foot face. Yeah. And they say, how big's the waves? He says, oh, four feet. Yeah. <laughs> downplay. Always downplay. Yeah. Six, right? six maybe four, maybe eight. <laughs> of course. And then, and then, and then the, oh, the, the lifeguards are all wet all the time. <laughs> yes. That's so funny. I did a show about wave heights and how they're measured differently everywhere i'm going to link that in this link right up at the top here but um yeah it's funny you know hawaii they always it seems like they chop the face height oh, in yeah. half that's it, the way they do nothing, it nothing it's nothing good it's a good stuff <laughs> but the wedge it's face height man you're, yeah. you're going you're going to you're going to claim every foot of that wave face at a spot uh, like the wedge so. yeah yeah, so it sounds like Hurricane Marie was the was the granddaddy swell, and I think so too. At least in the thirty five years I've lived in Southern California, and that's the biggest I've seen it. You know, and every time I every time I see that happen, I think of myself back being raised in Long Beach. Yeah. How big would that wave have been? Yeah. Had World War Two not built a breakwater for us? Oh man! And it's coming all the way up from like yes. halfway down there. I don't know how far down it would go from up from Hawaii from uh, uh, Mexico. Yep, unopposed. Right. So Fred, what Fred's talking about in Long Beach, they built a system of breakwaters to World War II. to protect the harbor in World yeah. War Two, so yeah. battleships could come in and out, presumably, yeah. and it essentially cut off all the surf from Long Beach. There's one section of Long Beach that if it's a massive, massive swell, there's a tiny window that swell can sneak through. I don't even know where it is. I've seen videos of it's it. It's around the tail end uh, between it. It, just comes up, it comes up from the 
It misses the south end of Catalina Island. Okay. It has to be like this tight little window yeah. to get in there. But basically it eliminated the surf from Long Beach and, you know, uh, who knows how big it would have gotten well, there all, nowadays, all, right, on the, the big way, south uh, All the way from Seal Beach, it, 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 confu it, <clears throat> did, it, it did stuff to the break it. Seal Beach on uh, up to Point Furman. Uh, Point Furman. Wow. Just destroyed it. Crazy. Yeah. You can never do that nowadays, you know. Like I, I think about Killer Dana, Dana Point yeah. Harbor. They built and, and killed a few surf yeah. spots there too. So yeah, yeah, it's crazy. So final question for you, Fred. We've been at this for a while. Um, this is our second half an hour show. And yeah. what do you want your legacy to be in the world of wave riding, or do you not care? I don't care. That's good. I like that. No. You're not concerned with leaving a legacy. You well, yeah. had you had a great life. You had fun. You're still having fun yeah. and enjoying all the, you know, the fruits of your life as a person that yeah. enjoys the ocean. I, 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 you know, I I never took a wave to show off. That's a good quote. I have never been in a contest. Oh, really? Yeah. You never did any of the body no, surfing. No, events. no, no. Wow. What, what am I going to do? Yeah. Cut that guy off. What am I going to do? Spinners underneath him. What is that all about? Yeah. If, you know, if nature didn't want me to have a beautiful wave come flying in. Yes. And I wasted it by showing off. Uh, I'd be embarrassed. There's something to be said for that because a lot of people are in it for the wrong reason. Clearly, you aren't. You. You have been a wave rider all your life because you enjoy the ocean. You enjoy riding waves. Well, if if somebody if that if that what you say is true, and it wasn't sponsored and it wasn't paid for, yep. and it wasn't uh, wasn't uh, rigged, yeah, then I'm just lucky. Yes, it's like I was born a bastard. Well, <laughs> <laughs> that brings us full circle yeah. in this interview to yeah. the very beginning. I love that, man. Well, let's wrap it up on that. Fred, it's been an honor to speak with you and get your story, man. Because there's a lot no, of stuff I didn't know fun. about you and about Viper and your body surfing days. And I hope to be there on your 100th birthday <laughs> when, you, when you swim out to the ledge oh, and catch a I wave. hope to be there. You yes, don't hope. I do. <laughs> we all do, man. We all do. So, folks, that's Fred Simpson. That's his story. He's sticking to it. We're so stoked to have had you here watching The Real Deal Show. Thank you so much. If you watch on YouTube, subscribe, give us the thumbs up, throw some comments in for Fred. We'll relay those to him because I'm doubting he's going to be on YouTube too often. <laughs> uh, and we're just so pleased to have him. So thanks again, folks. We'll see you next time on The Real Deal Show, and we'll see you in the surf. A gentleman and a scholar. <laughs>